Good morning, everybody. Um, we're just taking an opportunity this this morning while we're all enjoying what's now week two of a four-week lockdown, and hopefully, very much fingers crossed, that it isn't extended. Um, take some take some time to um, over the next certainly today and to, and for the next couple of weeks to learn maybe something new while we've got maybe a little bit of extra free time on our hands. So, and we really, really appreciate Glenn for making himself available at uh, seven o'clock in the morning in Melbourne. Um, the background image is a lie. It's not sunny at all. So really, really appreciate you coming, coming on, making yourself available, Glenn. And depending on how today goes, I think we spoke about doing something similar again after Easter, but we'll, we'll, we'll sort of see how today runs. We hadn't really got a format uh, locked down, so we're quite open to uh, people throwing in questions at any stage and we'll just have a bit of a free form conversation around technical problems and the common, I guess the common problems you see and uh, maybe some good, bad and ugly. We'll, uh, we'll see how we go, but we'll, We'll sort of leave it open to you guys because it's 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 for the benefit of you that we're running this, not not us. So I'll hand it over to you now, Glenn. Thanks, Dave. Yes, yeah, so um, this is a little bit of a trial to see uh, what benefit want and what uh, areas that you would like to know more about. So I've kept it a fairly basic um, uh, intro to some of the issues around in, um, the solar, in solar PV and what I call the seven deadly sins. Um, they're also a good avenue to look at some of the technical issues associated with solar. Uh, oh, my head keeps disappearing. So if you're wondering what's behind me, that's actually my house um, where I live here at Marumura Co-op. Uh, it's also where I have my smart energy lab and uh, it is actually nighttime here. So that's a, that photo's backdrop's a lie. Um, finally, just to remind everyone who's just joined that there is a Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen, which is a great place to, to ask questions. Um, you can also chat uh, within the chat window, but Q&A is, is kind of more beneficial for me. I can see the list of questions as they come up. So please feel free throughout the presentation just to, to ask any questions you like. So I'm just going to um, click over to my presentation screen and uh, where are we? about four screens open at the moment. <laughs> See how this goes. Yeah, that's it, good. Okay, so what you should be able to see now is um, the seven deadly myths of solar. Uh, just to confirm that you can see it, does someone wanna type something into the chat window or, or just to let me know that um, it's all working for you? Great, thanks Dean, excellent. All right, well, let's, let's kick off. Um, the reason I produced this um, set of 10 slides was really uh, for the industry who often have uh, myths that, that they um, hold dearly about how solar works. And uh, some, many of these are holding back the, the uh, ability to install more solar or even install it, or even to give the best um, outcomes to the customer. Down the bottom, by the way, I've put my mobile phone number. Um, you may, after the event, um, want to text me some questions as a follow-up, that's fine by me. Uh, so there's my number. So um, I kind of based this on Mythbusters, hence the silly busted slide. Um, these are the, the seven myths that I want to focus on. Uh, uh, East-West arrays, or arrays that face different directions onto the same inverter. Um, why oversizing a PV power system uh, to the inverter's capacity is actually a good idea and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, why inverters are smart and control current. Um, south, well, is south any good? We'll find out. And what about shading, orientation, and, and, and optimum tilt angle? So those are the kind of things I wanted to, to cover. So 
This is one of the persisting myths that really drives me nuts. Um, I hear it a lot, which is you can't split an array on a single cable. Now, if you look at the little diagram I've drawn there, I've got a house with a, an east facing roof and a west facing roof, and there's equal number of panels on both sides. Now that actually is critical to this discussion. Um, if you parallel separate strings of PV, each string must be the same number of panels, must be the same um, type, uh, and must also in each string face the same direction. So we've got on the east side, they all face east, and on the west side, they all face west, and they're electrically connected in parallel. Uh, so this is perfectly okay. And you don't actually have to use a dual um, input inverter, one which has two maximum PowerPoint trackers, um, sometimes called an MPPT, uh, because there is uh, a lucky bit of physics that means that when you parallel uh, strings of different orientations, their voltages stay very similar throughout the day because of the way the voltage of a panel varies with the radiance and temperature uh, in opposite directions. So I won't go into too much tech about that, but if you're wondering, um, A, are you allowed to do it? Yes, you are. So New Zealand standards um, 5033, which is the PVRA standard, says you're allowed to connect um, panels in a single string um, uh, or multiple strings as long as all panels in each string uh, independently face the same direction. So why would you do it? It's probably another question. You might go, well, most of the inverters that we sell have um, multiple inputs. Um, that's not always the case. Or you may find that you've got an inverter with two inputs, but you want to put three strings onto it. So there's sometimes an opportunity to parallel um, two strings together. So there's other reasons that east-west or even just multiple orientations are a good idea too, uh, apart from the fact that not everyone has enough roof area uh, to actually mount all of um, the system on one roof area. They might need to split it across multiple roof areas. Um, also, if you're trying to maximize um, self-consumption of solar energy, which is just about always the best option for a grid connected system without batteries, that means that the solar energy that you produce is being used internally uh, in the home and not being exported to the grid uh, by having multiple orientations gives you a longer production curve and for particularly for people who uh, are lucky enough not to be in lockdown and go to work <laughs> um, they're likely to use energy at either end of the day and a, a, an array which has a, an east and a west face actually will produce energy earlier in the morning the eastern face and later in the afternoon the western face so you actually get better self-consumption so there you go. Um, split arrays are allowed as long as all strings, all panels in each string um, face the same direction. Oversizing. Uh, now, there's a confusing concept here, which is that you'll hear an inverter is rated by power. So it might say this inverter is a five kilowatt inverter. Uh, it doesn't mean that inverter cannot accept a bigger array than five kilowatts, it means its output AC power is five kilowatts. Now, now a PV system is also rated in kilowatts, but they're not real watts. <laughs> they're, they're watts based on um, irradiance, how much energy is coming from the sun, um, temperature, time of day, all sorts of factors. And almost always you will lose um, some of those nameplate rated watts so if you have a, an array that's rated at five kilowatts uh, on the nameplate, uh, but you put it in the sun, as it heats up, it loses power. And depending on how hot, or hot it is in your area, um, you, know, you could lose 10 to 15% of your nameplate rating on a sunny day. So the reality is that a five kilowatt array will almost never put out five kilowatts. So if you're trying to convert with a inverter DC power to AC power, the conversion efficiency is probably about 95% or better. So you're going to lose some of that energy anyway as heat in the inverter. So you want to start with a bit more power than you hope to peak out on the output side. And also 
you want to allow for those losses due to temperature on the PV array. So a good kind of rule of thumb, um, and uh, actually this is a little bit Australian here, I call it the silly CEC guidelines. Um, CEC is the Australian um, body that uh, manages accreditation and installers, the Clean Energy Council. Uh, they have some guidelines which embarrassingly I helped write about 10 years ago. And in those guidelines, um, we gave some sort of uh, rule of thumb was the word recommendations about maximum sizing of PV systems with respect to inverter power. And uh, what we said was uh, you should have at least, sorry, a maximum of 75% of your um, output power rating of your inverter to the peak watts of your array. If you reverse the maths on that, that means your, your array should be about up to 133% bigger than your inverter power. So a five kilowatt uh, AC output inverter, maximum 6.6 .6 kilowatts of PV. Now, that maximum is just a design optimization. It's not an electrical safety limit. Uh, the thing to consider here is that inverters are actually smart loads. They determine how much um, uh, current they'll draw from an array and therefore how much power they'll produce. They actually operate the array. So if you oversize your array within the manufacturer's guidelines, so that's a key um, condition here, the manufacturers will often say maximum DC input and they'll give you a value. Um, typically that's you know, 20, 30, 40, up to 250% with some inverters uh, of their output power. Um, the inverter will control that power and produce what it needs. Now you might say, well, why, why would you want to put more PV than the inverter can actually produce um, as AC output? Well, not every day looks like a perfect day, like I've drawn here on this uh, little bumpy graph. Um, you know, you have overcast conditions, cloudy conditions, etc. So on overcast days, a bigger system will get up to the peak, even on a less than ideal uh, uh, situation. So. Oversizing PV helps you produce more renewable energy um, from that inverter. So you've got to consider the economics in this too. Um, is it worth putting more panels on or should you just get a bigger inverter? Um, but there is no practical problem with oversizing PV. And that diagram just shows that even though theoretically you could have produced more, it's clipped, it's not produced, it's not dumped as heat, you don't have to worry about um, overheating panels or inverters, uh, it's just not produced. So um, in summary on that one, generally oversizing of 20% or more is normal and a good idea. Uh, a related consideration too is the um, input current limit on inverters. Now inverters often will say maximum input current 15 amps and you might uh, uh, or whatever the number is and you might uh, look at your panel currents and realize that the panels two, two strings in parallel might put out more than 15 amps and you go oh that's going to blow the inverter up I can't do that. Well actually that's not the case. The inverter as I said before is a smart load it determines um, how much current to draw from the array. And so it will be current limiting to whatever its input rated current is. So if you did have an array that could produce say 16 amps, but the inverter has a maximum input current of 15, then it's gonna limit the current to 15. It, it self protects it by choosing how much current to draw from the panels. Um, there is another consideration though, which is the current rating of your plugs and sockets. Um, for instance, if you were to have a fault in the inverter and there was a short circuit current flowing from the array, the plugs and sockets must be able to carry that, that fault current. So um, typically you know, your MC4 type connectors are rated at 25 or 30 amps. So they have quite a high current rating anyway, but that's the absolute limit is the current rating of your cables, plugs and sockets. Now I'm just uh, looking at the, the Q&A window. I haven't got any questions. Um, feel free to type some in there um, rather than just listen to me chat away. Now here's another one. Um, this still gets me a bit grouchy because I, I can't believe people still don't understand this. 
Um, in Australia, I've heard installers say it's illegal to install panels facing south. Now, if you're wondering what um, STCs are, that's an Australian thing, so just ignore that. But it just, uh, it's a government rebate associated with PV. Um, a south-facing array in Auckland will actually probably produce more energy than one in Germany optimally faced, which ironically, because Germany's in the Northern Hemisphere, you face your panels to the south to get the best production, but I just call it optimally facing. So there's actually nothing wrong with facing panels in other than what you might think of as optimal orientation. They still work, um, they will still produce energy, but their production will be reduced somewhat depending on um, how steep pitch the roof is um, and any localized shading that might occur. Uh, in the case of south being probably the worst option of a roof, um, the pitch makes a big difference. So a fa fairly shallow pitched roof of 10 or 15 degrees um, in summertime will be almost the same as north because the sun's directly above most of the day. It's a fairly steep angle. So south in summer uh, in Auckland, anywhere in New Zealand, is fine on a fairly flat roof. The production won't be um, curtailed much at all. But on a um, steeper pitch roof, um, hi Seng, thanks for typing a Q in there um, in the Q and A. Um, is a uh, steep pitch roof, say 30 to 40 degrees, will see a significant drop off in winter time because the angle of the sun is very low. But it doesn't mean it's not worth it. Um, for instance, on less than ideal days when it's overcast, the sun is um, coming through clouds and the light is scattered. And so we call that indirect solar radiation. Uh, indirect solar radiation comes from all directions, not just uh, directly from the sun. So it really doesn't matter which way panels face. On an overcast day, they all work pretty much the same. So your south facing array on less than sunny days is just as good as your north facing array. And finally, which is not a bullet point, um, really, the roof is the asset that the customer has and uh, maximizing that asset for generation is the objective of a good design and that may involve using um, more than just the optimal orientated roof areas. So don't be put off by a, a roof that doesn't face to the north. Um, there are other reasons for orientating um, in other directions. Okay, you, you're a quiet bunch out there. I haven't had um, any questions um, or on the, or, uh, in the Q&A window? Oh, here we go. Thanks, Dave. Um, what is the most common error seen in installations ignoring rooftop isolators? Um, mismatched MC4's labeling. <laughs> um, wow. So there is actually quite a lot of stats on this in Australia because in Australia, uh, there's a government inspection program um, called the Clean Energy Regulator, uh, who regulate the, um, the financial benefits associated with installing solar. And so they do uh, forensic inspections of a statistically significant number of systems uh, around Australia continuously, and they pick up uh, lots of faults. Um, I haven't got the stats right in front of me, but I think Dave's probably hit on the, the key ones um, uh, and ignoring the rooftop isolator issue, which is not a, such a problem in New Zealand because you've got an exemption from having to put one of those silly things on the roof. Um, uh, the mismatching of connectors. Now, Dave's referred to MC4s, which is a, a popular uh, brand. Now, it's not a type, it's a brand. It's not generic um, of connector. In the standards, it says that all connectors must be the same type and brand on both sides of the connection. That means if uh, the panel manufacturers put in um, some amphenol connectors on the end of their panels and your inverter has um, MC4 plugs and sockets, uh, you can't, even though they might physically plug into each other, they're not guaranteed to actually mate properly or work properly in a reliable fashion. So you need to actually change those connectors. Um, usually that's where um, someone would cut off the connector on the home run cable or the array cable and uh, change it to suit the inverter. So that is a big problem because mismatching of connectors often leads to thermal overload or thermal failure over time because it's not a, a good electrical connection. Um, Labelling still a big problem. Um, 
in the, partly because the standards are a little bit confusing around labeling and uh, depending on which version of the PV ray standard or the inverter standard you're looking at, uh, there is some um, uh, uh, contradictory requirements and signage, but in general, um, the, the issues are uh, that the signage isn't in the appropriate location um, for the system uh, and it isn't uh, correctly filled out. Uh, some of the signage that comes out has a space to fill out the details, like your open circuit voltage of the array and short circuit current of the array. Uh, people often don't realize that that's the calculated open circuit voltage under coldest conditions, not just the nameplate rating of the panels. So you need to factor in uh, a temperature rise um, of voltage, temperature induced rise of voltage. So as a panel gets colder, their volts go up. Oh good, we're getting lots of questions coming in here. Um, on transformless inverters, actually just since I'm taking these questions, I'm just going to go back to me so you can see me. There we go. Um, uh, thanks. On transformless inverters, this is the question that just came in. Does the DC isolator need to be rated twice the voltage rating of the array? Um, excellent question. Now, I could probably spend an hour explaining this, but <laughs> um, in, in short, approximately correct. Uh, the reality is that transformless inverters under fault will pass the full current through just one switched leg of an array. So if you've got a positive and negative cable coming down from your roof, under fault, the fault current might be passing just through the positive, for instance, uh, through the inverter, out through the AC output, through your MEN, back through earth, back up to the earth fault on the array on the roof. And therefore your, your DC isolator has to interrupt on just one switched pole, the full current and open circuit voltage of the array. So that means if um, a DC isolator says on the packet, a uh, thousand volts and 25 amps, it, that, it may be, and you've got to check the, the labeling carefully on the product, it may be only if both poles are operated in unison interrupting the current equally across both switched poles. So uh, yeah, in a, in, in a sort of simple analysis, that really just means uh, you're probably gonna derate that significantly when you connect it to a transformless inverter, which these days is basically every inverter. I see um, InnoSolar have closed their inverter manufacturing. So there's really only Fronius Galvos left on the market that are transformer based. Um, Kate, I can see your question coming in. Um, tile roof versus tin roof. Um, does this change the performance of a solar panel? Um, so if, I guess you're referring to the fact that uh, it's um, a temperature difference. So a tin roof you would think might be hotter than a tile roof. Well, it might be on the surface exposed to the sun, but underneath the panels, they're in full shade. So it actually makes little difference whether the roof is tin or tile, under the panels they'll be at ambient temperature. There's no direct solar radiation on them. So um, I, I, I wouldn't see any significant performance difference uh, between tin and tile. Brad, um, with the connectors, is that for New Zealand as well? Yes, it is. So New Zealand and Australia share a common set of standards for um, renewables. Um, 5033 is the PV array standard, 4777, um, is the inverter standard. And now we have a battery standard, which is still ambiguous whether it applies in New Zealand, but it does seem to be based on what the regulators uh, stated. And that's 5139. Um, New Zealand has pretty much all the same requirements, uh, except in the PV array standard, there is an exemption for um, not requiring an isolator adjacent to the PV array, which is commonly called the rooftop isolator. It's a very sensible exemption. Um, we're actually working a new version of 5033 at the moment. Um, I'm the work group leader for that project and uh, we're trying to find a way of getting rid of the rooftop isolator uh, for Australia, but New Zealand's very staunch on this. They don't want one, not gonna change their position, good on you. Um, and in terms of connectors, yes, the connector requirements are the same in New Zealand as Australia. Thanks, Brad. Um, uh, Singh, um, what is the requirement for the AC 
battery labels in New Zealand? What standards should we be looking at, for example, when installing a Tesla Powerwall? So this is, uh, like I said, still a little bit ambiguous. There is a new battery standard, which was published last year, um, NZS 5139. Uh, 5139 is not referenced in New Zealand electrical regs yet. But what the um, WorkSafe New Zealand regulator has said is that since it is not replacing an existing standard, it is advice on how to um, safely install a battery. And so it could be argued that it is already required to be complied with from a, um, from a safety perspective. So if that's the case, um, you need to consider, um, uh, in the case of a Tesla Powerwall, it's what's known as the best battery energy storage system, which means it's got a battery and an inverter in a box. Uh, it's got isolation requirements um, and labeling requirements specified in that standard. Now, um, the question's probably a bit broad um, to answer glibly thing, sorry. Um, I would suggest you get a copy of that standard. And for a Tesla Powerwall, you'd be looking closely at section four, which is for um, BESSES that comply with the best practice guide, such as the Tesla Powerwall. Um, thanks, Dave. 5139 is being enforced by WorkSafe, says Dave, even though it is not ratified. Yep, it is rather ambiguous. Um, but it is a it is a good safety standard. Um, there's a few bits which I probably don't fully agree with, even though I'm on the committee that wrote it. Um, but uh, that's what happens. Um, Dave, regarding DCI side is built into inverters. Uh, there are very few that comply with 5033 revision two. Now, what Dave's referring to there is that, um, and once again, we're caught up with this peculiar problem that New Zealand um, and Australia are out of step when it comes to when uh, a standard's enforced. In Australia, it's based on usually just so many months after a pu this publication of the standard, but in New Zealand, it's based on referencing in the electrical rigs. Um, 5033, you're still under the 2012 edition, even though we've got 2014 being published and two amendments to it, amendments one and two. Um, amendments one and two were written really to help get rid of the DC isolator that you have to mount on the wall next to the inverter. And the reason for it, it turned out it was the one that was most likely to cause a house fire if it failed. And uh, it was seen as kind of redundant when many inverters had a built-in DC isolator that was manufactured in a factory to a test standard uh, that was you know, pretty much deemed to work as opposed to a, a product that an installer selected um, hopefully correctly and installed hopefully correctly. So the revision two um, has got some requirements around that the integrated DC isolator within an inverter must also be lockable in the off position, must interrupt all conductors, um, must be labeled on and off, and uh, the manufacturer must issue a declaration of conformity uh, to that amendment. There isn't very many inverters that um, tick all those boxes because the other more difficult requirement is that the inverter is um, repaired by replacement only there's no serviceable parts inside the inverter. So you can't take the cover off and access any, any of the DC components. Um, so in, uh, in, you know, talk, in terms of brands, um, I don't know about you, Dave, but I guess the um, uh, uh, Sunny Boy Storage and Sunny Boy um, inverters both have that integrated DC isolator. So that would appear um, to meet that requirements because the SMA have a declaration of conformity to it. Um, and Dave, uh, 5139 is already considered best practice by WorkSafe, yeah. So uh, I guess Dave's really raising um, the point that the battery standard 5139, even though it's not ratified in the New Zealand electrical regs, is going to be enforced, uh, particularly if there is an issue. So, you know, often it doesn't till, it's not till something fails that, um, that uh, a standard gets uh, fully applied. And so if there's an issue, a, a house fire or, or a, um, an injury or fatality, that's, that's when this uh, will come into very significant uh, impact. Uh, I suggest you get a copy of 5139. Those who have access to Standards New Zealand can download it for free. If you've 
um, part of the EWB um, and have a good read. I will probably focus on this in future webinars. So um, I'll chat with Dave about this one, but uh, it is uh, an area that there's a lot of training required to understand the application of standard. Now, um, I did say this would be a, a, basically a half hour webinar, but I got a few more slides. So if you don't, if you don't mind hanging around for a bit longer, I'll just uh, go through those. And where are we? Uh, share screen, hang on. Uh, got too many screens open. There we go. Good. Okay, so we've done south facing arrays, almost there. Three more. Um, shading is bad. I mean, yes, shading of a PV array will produce less energy. Uh, dust doesn't mean that it's automatically not a suitable location. Um, you may find that a customer is prepared to accept some production loss due to shading. It might be based on season or time of day. Um, but uh, there are many ways to mitigate against the effects of shading. And one of those is what's known as microinverters, so small inverters on the back of each panel. What they do is they operate each panel independently of every other panel. And there's devices which do it on a DC level. They're known as DC-DC uh, uh, converters or DCUs. Um, oh, there's a mistake in my notes there. It should be DCUs, not PCUs. Uh, such as the Solar Edge Optimizer, uh, the Tigo Optimizer. Also, Huawei have one as well for their inverters. So that means that if you do have some shading issues on a roof, you can design that problem to be minimized by using module level power electronics. So don't rule out straight away um, a shaded roof. Now I can see there's some chat questions as well. Uh, thanks for that. So Keith um, says, I would have thought a steeper roof facing south would work better in winter. Uh, actually, no. Unfortunately, at the latitude of New Zealand, a south facing roof won't even get the sun in winter uh, if it's more than about 30 degrees pitch because the sun doesn't actually enter the southern section of the sky. It rises in the northeast and sets in the northwest and the sun uh, in midwinter, its zenith will be less than 30 degrees depending on where you are in New Zealand. If you're down in Christchurch, probably about 25 degrees above the horizon. So it won't even shine directly on the south side of the roof. But Keith, conversely, in summer, a south facing array actually starts earlier in the day because the sun rises in particularly the further south you go, so if you're down in Christchurch, those uh, will be aware of this problem, the sun rises uh, in the southeast and sets in the southwest. So even before um, the sun would fall on the northern side of a roof, your south um, in the morning is, is being blistered by, by sun. So south facing does give a better performance in summer in the beginning and ends of the day than the north facing array. Um, I see Sheldon's asked a question of the panelists. Um, so where we go. So it's okay to have 18 amps on a 15 amp input as long as it doesn't exceed the maximum wattage uh, for the single input. Uh, it's maximum current for that uh, for the the connector, not the uh, input current rating of the inverter. So Sheldon, for instance, if you have two strings of nine amps and you want to parallel them onto one 15 amp input on an inverter the input is going to current limit to 15 amps. So you'll get some clipping. Uh, that means in a peak conditions, you won't produce full power. But as long as that input can carry that 18 amps under fault, because it, if there is an internal fault with the inverter, you will get that 18 amps passing through that um, connector. And most of the connectors are rated at well over 20 amps. So um, I, it's not a problem. Um, uh, Ma Hoskin, is that Greg? No, Mark, Mark Hoskin, g'day Mark. Um, hi Glenn, uh, can you talk a bit about split arrays with 
optimizers and how many optimizers need to go on it. Say two panels were regularly in shade on east face uh, with a 6-6 six, six split uh, on the west face. Now, Mark, this depends very much on what the product is. So for instance, if you're using Solar Edge system, every panel must have an optimizer. In Solar Edge, um, they actually don't have a maximum power point tracker in the inverter. They rely on the optimizers to perform that function. And therefore, without optimizers on every panel, the system won't work. Whereas with Tigo, they're a generic solution. You don't need to use any particular brand of inverter. Um, they optimize per panel and they can be um, uh, applied uh, to just the problem panels. But when you've got parallel strings, Tigo say that you need the same number of optimizers on each string. So if you've got um, six east and six west, and there is shading on the western roof on one panel, so you might put an optimizer on that one panel, you need to match it with an optimizer on the east side as well. Um, it doesn't have to be in the same position in the string, but it needs to be in the string. So that's something to check with, um, with Tigo uh, if you're using their product. And if you're using Huawei, Huawei have um, uh, optimizers that actually can be uh, partially deployed. So you can put them on some of the panels and not all. Um, um, don't know about splitting the array with Huawei. So that might be, I haven't tried that. I've got one here, but I haven't actually tried it. Um, Donald, Donald Trump's joined us. Oh, wow, thanks Donald. Um, um, Melanie says that 32 degrees is great for panel tilt, what do you think? Well, I'm coming up to that in a second, um, Donald. So I'll just answer that one now. Uh, so, no, actually it's the last one. Uh, West is best. These two last two slides really are complimentary. Um, I've, you hear these kind of, you know, myths or rules, people go, ah, oh, yeah, if you've got a, a roof and there's an east roof and a west roof, the west is gonna be better than the east. Well, um, it's not necessarily true. What you might be looking at is just say the solar production might be better on the western side, maybe because um, there's less cloud in the afternoon. So once again, that's a local issue, what the weather's like. Um, it might be because the energy is required in the afternoon more than in, in the morning. So that's a it's consideration of the customer's load profile. Um, and it may well benefit your network operator um, because that might be when the peak demand is in the afternoon. So there might be some uh, incentives for that, but that's pretty unusual. Um, but you'll probably find that the panels will be hotter in the afternoon because they've had all day for the ambient temperature to rise. And uh, you will actually get more thermal losses in the afternoon uh, than you will in the morning. So it comes down to a bunch of factors. Um, what's the customer's load? When are they in the morning or the afternoon that you want to cover? Um, is there any localized cloud uh, that's typical in the morning or the afternoon? That's often depends on whether you're in the tropical zone or not. Those are more important decisions than just a simple rule like West is best. So to fully answer Donald's question, um, uh, optimum tilt angle. What's the optimum tilt, tilt angle? Well, once again, there is no real optimum tilt angle because it's all about what you're trying to achieve. Now here's a picture of a commercial system with the panels perfectly flat on the roof. Now we can say pretty, with pretty you know, with confidence that a flat array won't be optimal. Um, unless you are in the tropics where the sun is directly above you pretty much all day long, um, a flat array will have significantly less performance than a tilted array. But in the case of a commercial system like this, it might come down to other factors, such as um, square meterage of the roof that you can cover will be greater if you put the panels flat than if you tilt them. Because if you tilt them, you've got to have, um, you'll have shade between rows and you've got to have spaces to allow for that shading. Uh, also, um, the aesthetics, the wind loading, uh, those can be considerations. So in this case, flat was probably chosen for just maximum coverage on the roof and also low cost of installation. It's, it's cheaper. And sometimes just adding more panels um, is gonna solve the problem rather than try to optimize the panel, a, a lesser number of panels. But I should point out that as soon as you put 
framed modules horizontal, they collect dirt really badly. And uh, so a cleaning regime tends to be part of that. Otherwise they become muddy puddles after a while. Also completely covering the roof will give quite a lot of cooling benefit if you're in a hot climate or high solar radiance. So it's fully shading the roof and uh, you get a lot of PV on top of it. Um, so that brings me to the end of that little presentation on the seven myths of solar. Um, do we have any, any final questions from, from, uh, from anyone? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, well, I might just hand back to Dave just to do the outage. Hey, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, giving up your morning. I hope you all got something out of that. Um, Feel free to message either me or Glenn or whatever if you've got anything to follow up and we'll we'll try and deal with it as best we can. But, um, thank you, thank you all for making the time. And probably equally as importantly, let me know if this has been of benefit. If should it um, should we do things any differently? And because we do have the opportunity to do either more or less of this sort of thing. Um, at, the, at the moment, certainly over the next couple of weeks. Uh, thanks, Dave. And yes, uh, I will distribute the slides. Uh, I've got the your email addresses that came through with the registration. I'll send them back to you. Brilliant. Thank okay. You. Thank Good you. One. All right. See everyone. <laughs> See you, Dave. Yeah. See you, mate.